Hello, it's Mr. Liebforth again, Mr. Cote, and some, uh, some students are here with me as well. Maybe they'll help me out. We're doing part two of the second semester exam review. We're going to talk about chapter 10, 11, and 12. So circles, area, and then volume and surface area from chapter 12. So here we go. Um, you want to start by drawing a circle. You can either do a fancy one like this, or you can just draw a circle on your own, which is what you'll have to do. Let's draw a chord. This is a chord. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the radius is perpendicular to the chord. And so we know that if a radius is perpendicular to the chord, then it bisects the chord. That was one of the rules we went over. And the converse of that is also true. Um, if you have a chord in a circle, <coughs> and you have a bisection there, then that's going to force that to be perpendicular as well. All right, and the most common thing we have there is um, kind of these right triangles. And these right triangles, you know, it'll be isosceles because those are radius lengths. You got the reflexor property. Those triangles are always going to be congruent triangles. Same thing over here. Um, you got a side, side, side congruence on that. And so those will be congruent right triangles, which will be helpful. It'll set up some of the Pythagorean theorem stuff from the last chapter. So again, that just popped up for you. But if it's perpendicular, if a radius is perpendicular, um, then it bisects the chord. And if uh, a radius bisects the chord, then it's perpendicular. And so that um, kind of finishes off that first section. And the next section, I'll just hand draw my circle this time. Let's say you have a chord in a circle that's a certain distance away. And then you have another chord in the circle that's the same distance away. Well, you should know that the chords, so this chord here, and this chord here will be congruent. They'll be the same length. So that's going to be hard to mark, but you know, this chord and this chord will be congruent to each other. So if they're the same distance away, um, they're the same length. Um, and actually, the closer it gets to the center, the closer a chord gets to the center, um, the bigger it is, and the farther away, the smaller the chord gets. So that's another idea we talked about um, in that second section. Uh, the third section, we started to talk about arcs and the relationship between arcs and angles. And so one of the highlights there was this idea of a central angle. If you have an angle coming from the center, that's maybe 50 degrees. We said that the measurement of the arc, so this arc measure, would be exactly the same size. So it would be 50 degrees as well. Size is a bad word. I should say it measures, the arc measures 50 degrees. Because we already talked about arc length and how that meant something different. So this is the measurement of the arc. So 50 degree central angle, 50 degree measurement of the arc. All right, and so we talked about minor and major arcs, a bunch of things there. Um, another highlight from the next section was you have a central angle. That's a certain size. If I have a, a second angle over here somewhere, not necessarily vertical, but just the same size. If those are the same size angles, then the arcs are the same size. And then if I can draw a little chord in here as well, these chords will be the same size as each other. So let me be real clear with that. So the central angles are the same size, maybe like 30 degrees. The chords are the same length, so maybe like four units long. And then the arcs will be both 30 degrees and 30 degrees. So the arcs and the chords and the central angles, if one of those is congruent, one of those pairs is congruent, all the rest will be congruent as well. Um, and so that was a highlight of that section. Okay, so draw a new circle then. And we want to talk about tangents. Tangents touch the circle at one point. So this is a tangent. Sometimes they call me a tangent when they see me during the summer. Do you get it? Tangent, because I'm like a, a gentleman who's tan. Um, this is a secant. Um, you know, it's pretty typical for me to, to take it away really fast and like, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see. And I'm like, no, it, it's not can't see, it's see can't. That's the part where you guys laugh. <laughs> All right, excellent, thank you. Oh, Mr. Cote is telling me I got time. All right, so tangent, what we want to talk about is the highlight of this uh, next section that if you have a radius going to the tangent, it's perpendicular at the point of tangency. And so that was a, a, a key idea for us that it's perpendicular, a radius is perpendicular um, at that point of tangency right here. Um, and so we use that for a number of things. We create right triangles off that. And, and likewise,
clockwise. Um, another idea there was if you have a tangent, so it's supposed to touch at one point, that's a really bad picture, that's my point, and you have another tangent, so you have a tangent and another tangent. Um, this was called what, the two tangent theorem? The tangents are, uh, are congruent to each other. Sometimes I call that the ice cream cone theorem, although that ice cream cone looks like it's knocked over. I know, I'm moving on, Mr. Cote. All right, um, what do we got next? So we continued on. So then we got, uh, we talked about the central angle already, um, but as we pull back to be an inscribed angle with a vertex on the circle, so inscribed, an inscribed angle is half the arc. So if the arc is 70, for example, the inscribed angle will be half as much, 35 degrees. So an inscribed angle is half of the arc it intercepts. Um, a special situation of that inscribed angle is when you have a diameter and you have an inscribed angle down here. Um, that, if this is a diameter of a circle, this is always going to be a right angle. You know why is that? Because this is half a circle, so 180 degrees. So this angle is going to be half as much, so 90 degrees. So again, you have that right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem stuff from chapter 9 coming back again um, in this section. Uh, then we inscribed, oh, that's cool, yellow circle. Then we inscribed uh, just a, a random quadrilateral, and we learned that these opposite angles, so like angle 1 and angle 2, angle 3 and angle 4. So 1 and 2 are supplementary and 3 and 4 are supplementary. So angle 1 is supplementary to angle 2 and angle 3 is supplementary to angle 4, which means they add up to be 180 degrees. All right, so if you, I give you one, you could find the other one. For example, if this was 80, this would have to be 100, okay? And if, if this was, I don't know, 120, really bad picture here, then this would have to be 60 degrees because they have to add up to be 180 degrees. All right, so that was chapter 10. Then we'll move into chapter 11. Chapter 11 was all about area. So a lot of these formulas you know from earlier years, but we built on those. But um, I'll just put the basic formulas out. You can add these to your note card. Um, we'll start off with a square. Um, a square has a base and a height. Of course, the base and the height are the same. And uh, so the area is base times height, or you could just take a side and square it. And that's why it's called a square. Um, so that's the first figure we have. Um, area of a square is base times height. Second figure that we have is a rectangle. Remember, a rectangle has you know, four right angles, it has opposite sides congruent, as well as many, many other things. Okay, the area of a rectangle is also base times height. So you have a base and a height, doesn't matter which one's which, and that'll find your area um, for a rectangle. Okay, so the area of a rectangle is base times height. For a parallelogram, same rule again. The area of a parallelogram is base times height. One of the common mistakes is to, uh, you know, kind of look at this slanted part right here um, as a height, and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure the height is the perpendicular height that we have marked. So the height needs to be straight up and down perpendicular. Um, so you have base times height is the area of a parallelogram. Um, as we move forward, we have a triangle. You know, it's the entire base length here times the height, and then it's half of that. So one half base times height. So that's base times height divided by two, or one half base times height. That's our old rule from um, that you probably remember from previous courses. So I'll write that down. Some of you guys like the base times height divided by two. That is just fine for me. It means the same thing. Uh, trapezoid was one that we highlighted. Some people like to break the trapezoids up. I like to use the formula. Um, the area of a trapezoid is the average of the bases. So you add the bases and divide by two. The bases, if you remember, are the parallel sides. So mine's a bad picture, but um, these two sides are meant to be parallel. So base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2, or 1 half base 1 plus base 2 times the height. And so you take the two bases, and again, we want to have the perpendicular height, um, not the slanted height. So a common mistake, again, is to look at this as the height, but we want this perpendicular height to represent the height of the trapezoid. So the area formula again is base 1 plus base 2 divided by the height. Sorry, base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2 times height. I'm trying to talk fast. And then you got 1 half uh, of the basis, um, some of the bases times the height. We move on to a uh, figure that has perpendicular diagonals. So we're talking about examples like a kite or a rhombus or a square. 
that have perpendicular diagonals. Basically, you take the diagonals and you multiply them and then you divide by two or multiply by a half. So this is the formula that we'll use, although some other formulas will fit those figures as well. Again, you can pause the video if I'm going too fast. You can go back, whatever you need to do. Equilateral triangle, you take a side. All the sides are the same size. So S stands for side. Um, this is the letter S. This is not a 5. So that S is the side of the equilateral triangle squared times the square root of 3 over 4. And that's how you find out in this special case for an equilateral triangle. You can go down to a regular hexagon. Regular hexagon is just six of those equilateral triangles. That's probably the easiest way to do it. So you find one of them and you multiply it out. That's for a regular hexagon. Area of a circle you probably have known for a long time. It's pi r squared. If you care, the circumference which we talked about earlier is 2 pi r and pi d. One or the other. Do not use that for area. Area is pi r squared. Um, area of a sector, if you look at that, um, you take the central angle and divide by 360. This is similar to the arc length formula we saw earlier, where you're taking a fraction of the circumference. Here you're taking a fraction of the area. That weird looking circle thing right there with a line through it, again, is what we call theta. It's just a fancy way of naming the central angle there. So you take the central angle, or the measure of the arc, you divide by 360 and you multiply by the area to get that little yellow shaded in piece called a sector. Sometimes though we want this piece out here um, and that's called a segment. How do you do that? Well you want to take the area of the whole kind of pie piece and then subtract out this triangular part and you'll be left with kind of that polka dotted section. So you find the area of a sector using this formula up here. You subtract the triangle, you know, one half base times height, or maybe it's equilateral, and then you're left with this little segment in the end. And so that's how you'll do that piece. I got three minutes left. So the formula's just flashed up. Again, this is the area of the uh, sector. You're going to subtract the area of a triangle. It's either one half base times height or side squared root three, you know, that whatever formula you're going to use. You can use, uh, we'll go back up. You're using the side squared root 3 over 4, or the 1 half base times height one from earlier. And so that's what you'll use for area of a triangle, and that will equal the segment when you're done. Which takes us to chapter 12, and I'm looking at my time. I have like three minutes left, so this is going to be pretty fast. Remember, you can pause the recording if you need to. Uh, the first um, figure that I want to talk about is prisms. You know, prisms have bases. The bases, um, there's two of them, and they both look the same. So. You know, we have like a trapezoidal prism, a triangular prism, and a rectangular prism. Um, and so what you want to do is to be able to find two different things. One is the lateral surface area, and one is the total surface area. For the first um, problem here, the lateral surface area is all the rectangular faces. For total surface area, you want to find that, but add the two bases to get the total surface. And the volume is, you find the area of the base, it might be a rectangular, or a triangular, or a trapezoid. So you go back to the chapter 11 rules and you multiply the height. The height is how far apart those bases are. Pyramid comes next. The lateral surface area is the triangle faces. And then for total surface area, you want to take that and add on the base. A lot of times we use a square base, but not always. And the volume is one third the area of that base times the height. Remember, the height is how tall the pyramid is. So this is the height that we're concerned about. And the base is this down there. Here's the cylinder formulas. R is the radius, H is the height. That fancy B down here means the area of the base. Flash to the cone here. So you have lateral surface area, total surface area, and volume. The L is the slant height, so you can see that here. You've got the height and the radius. For the sphere formula, all you need is the radius. So you have 4 pi r squared and 4 thirds pi r cubed. The hemisphere, you take half of that. So instead of 4, it's 2. And instead of 4 thirds, it's 2 thirds. But remember, this is kind of key for total surface area of a hemisphere. Don't forget that the base gets exposed when you cut it in half. And so you'll want to add that base on to the formula. So you can't just divide by 2. You need to make sure you're aware of the base. And that ends up our work for uh, second semester just in time. Good luck in the exam. I know you guys are going to do great. And uh, we'll see you in a couple days.